Welcome. I'm Glenn Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. This TV series explores a variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change. Everybody knows that our health care system is broken. The U.S.'s health care system is by far the most expensive in the world, but we lag behind a great many countries in access, outcomes, and other measures of effectiveness. The World Health Organization ranks us 37th. What makes the U.S. health care so expensive and yet so ineffective? Our system is bogged down with insurance companies that rip off 25% to 30% of our health care dollars without providing any real health care. Other national governments pay for their health care directly without insurance companies' overhead. The public, media, and politicians talk about reforming our health care system, but most of them are just tinkering around the edges so long as they ignore this elephant in the room. Republicans and Democrats alike, for the most part, refuse to eliminate this waste. Many politicians talk about universal coverage, but they do this in terms of insuring everybody and pushing people into the arms of the insurance companies with the government making the payments to the insurance companies for the people who don't have coverage at that time. A March 2009 Pew Research Center poll showed that the American people don't want just minor reforms to the current system. They want a major overhaul. 76% said it must be either, quote, fundamentally changed, unquote, or, quote, completely rebuilt, unquote. Regarding health care reform, as for so many other issues, the public is very far ahead of the politicians. This month's TV program examines the single-payer solution to our health care crisis. We have two very well-informed guests who can share their knowledge, their insights with us, and I'm happy to welcome Larry Kalb and Kent Davis. Good to have you both here. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. We've got a lot of content to cover, and we'll see how much we can pack into one hour. But I, I know it'll be very informative for the viewers because there's so much information that's not otherwise being reported in, in the media. What, uh, if you could summarize what some of the major problems are with our healthcare system in the U.S. as it exists now? Well, one thing that's a big problem is, as you mentioned, is the amount of money that's siphoned out of the healthcare system that's not being used for healthcare. Um, as you mentioned, roughly 30 cents of each dollar spent on health care uh, is really going to uh, insurance company profits, is going to uh, administration, going to other non-health related areas, um, and American people aren't getting the full bang for their buck. Mm -hmm. Well, also, uh, in the other industrialized nations, health care is a right, and uh, health care doesn't compete with uh, other uh, social programs, for example, education, um, or with um, housing, for example, or public transportation. Um, in other countries, of course, um, you don't have to be rich. It's not a privilege to have health care. And it, frankly, I think health care should be um, a right, just like uh, the right to free speech and, mm -hmm. and uh, voting. Mm -hmm. So. One of the things that, that has been talked about in the media is how many millions of people don't have any health coverage, and then they end up in, in some cases, either in the emergency room, which drives up the cost for everybody else, or waiting too long to get treatment, which causes more health problems or premature death. And those numbers, I've been watching those increase over the years. It's like 40 million, then 42 million, and you'd see 45 million reported in just the last few days before we uh, did the taping here, I read one estimate that said 46 million, another one that says 52 million. So that clearly is an upward trend of more and more people who just don't have health coverage. Right, as people are losing their jobs, yeah. they're losing their health care because unfortunately in this country, most health insurance is provided by the employer yeah. and it's tied to the employer. So if you are either unemployed or self-employed, um, you have to privately go out and get your own insurance. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and, and that's kind of an, an aberration in this country compared to other countries mm -hmm. that just didn't evolve that way. They evolved with, with the government uh, kind of program. Um, I, I read how uh, many of the bankruptcies that are occurring uh, are arising because, partly because of medical problems. One study showed that medical problems contributed to 62% of the bankruptcies that occurred in 2007. And I haven't seen data for 2008 yet, but um, it's just, it's amazing. Uh, oh, scary. <laughs> and, the, and the sad part about this is that 70% uh, of the people who are claiming bankruptcy already have insurance. That's right, yeah. So it's not just the, the people who don't have coverage, it's people who have it and it wasn't enough. Right. Because, uh, because of the way our insurance system works. Uh, what, to what extent are insurance companies part of the problem? Well, insurance companies are part of the problem because, again, of the, the, the drain from the health care dollar. Um, number one, uh, insurance companies are corporations that are responsible to their shareholders. Um, so therefore, their, their incentive of being in business is to make a profit so that they could share that profit with their shareholders. Mm -hmm. They are not in business to provide health care or to maintain America in a healthy manner. Uh, so they're, they're sort of in a conflict of interest uh, because on one hand, uh, they are controlling how we receive our health care. On the other hand, it's to their benefit not to provide health care to increase their profitability. Right. They, they have a lot of employees whose job it is to say, no, you're not qualified for that treatment or no, you have a pre-existing condition. We don't want you or whatever. I mean, they, they mm -hmm. make their profit by taking in more money than they pay out for our health care. That's right. So, and there's a, there, the net loss to the consumer, the patient, is built right into that system. That's exactly right. And so, you know, as president of Healthcare for All Washington, um, we go by the premise that uh, good health is the most precious gift in life. And actually, we're at the mercy of the market mm -hmm. right now. And as we all know, there is no mercy in the market. But uh, Kent hit the, hit the point right on the nose, and that is uh, Wall Street Medicine, by law, has to put the financial interest of its shareholders first mm. before giving, uh, providing care for any of the patients that are subscribed to right. their policies. And, that, and that's true for any corporation. They have a legal obligation they sure do. To, to make the most money they can for the shareholders. That's right. And, and they're not exist to be charitable toward sick people or anything like that. One of the things that, that Americans, I think, probably are united about is everybody hates bureaucracy. And people think about, like, government bureaucracy, but the uh, health insurance bureaucracy is even worse because they aren't accountable to us. At least we can vote for the politicians or vote against them right. if we don't like what they do. And the insurance companies, they've got their own bureaucracy, and every insurance company under our current system, they have their own claim forms, their own rules, their own uh, procedures, their own exclusions, their own this and that, and it, it chews up a lot of time and talent and effort out of the doctor's offices and the pharmacies and everybody to, to run all these multiple systems. It does. It's, it's massively redundant and it's all bureaucratic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all waste. Highly redundant. and. Um... You know, from 1970 to 2005, there has been a 2,500% increase in the amount of administrators who actually go and deny care for patients. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in a single-payer system, you would have one fully integrated first-dollar health care fund, which means everyone who is subscribed to this plan mm -hmm. pay into that uh, fund and all the doctors and hospitals are paid from that and you have one comprehensive uh, uh, benefit package and also along with that uh, it eliminates the uh, the conflict of interest here and that's mm -hmm. one thing that we need to put to rest mm -hmm. that medicine is a calling it's not a business mm -hmm. So single payer would eliminate that. Mm -hmm. Right. Another problem is again is the is the administrative issue that you brought up, is you know I remember when I was a child, um, I'd go to my doctor's office and who was in the office? It would be the doctor, and the nurse, and the nurse would be the nurse, and also would be 
like the bookkeeper or whatever. Yeah. Um, today, a, a doctor can't survive with just one person. He has to have four or five clerks working behind yeah. the scenes trying to collect money from the various insurance companies. Yeah. So it, that's the kind of cost that we need to get rid of. Right. It's, a, it's just a waste. With the, um, wa in May of 2009, the Washington Health Security Coalition created a list of, of what they felt were necessary features of a really, of a really good uh, health care reform. And I want to see if we can address some of these. Uh, two of the criteria for a good health care system were that it be universal and accessible. So it covers everybody and it's readily available for people to, to use. Can you tell us what, what it means for a system to be universal and what it means to be accessible? Well, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, universal is that everyone's covered. Mm -hmm. There's no age limit, there's no discrimination due to sex or nationality or citizenship. Everybody or, is or, covered. Or pre-existing conditions. Or pre-existing conditions, yeah. not tied to the employer. You have, you have a problem, you go see a doctor, you're covered. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a concern. Uh, accessibility is that there is adequate accessibility to doctors so that they're out there for you. So that when uh, what, that they have a term where they say automatic enrollment and immediate coverage mm -hmm. starts at the point of first medical contact. If you don't have anything, you just show up and you're, you're in Correct. it already. That's right. There's um, one enrollment for the entire yeah. state or for the entire nation. Yeah. And um, frankly, what will happen is you, you will receive a card such as this and it has a microchip in it. And if you uh, fall ill or if you're in an accident, you mm -hmm. take this card to the hospital, emergency room, doctor, clinic, wherever you may mm -hmm. be, and they'll run that card through and they'll see who you are. Yeah. And um, so the doctor is paid immediately. He doesn't have uh -huh. to worry about, you know, three months down the line, is he going to get reimbursed by the insurance company mm -hmm. finally? Uh, but he's paid directly on the spot. Yeah. And you don't have the problems that have been in the news lately where some hospital gets in trouble because they get people showing up at the emergency room and the hospital's afraid these guys won't be able to pay for their emergency care, so they just dump them back out into the street in some poor part of town. Well, another interesting thing about the same card is everyone knows when you go to the doctor, uh, if you're going to a specialist or, or a new doctor, the first thing you do is sit down and fill out three or four mm -hmm. pages of forms. Uh -huh. um, the same chip is going to have your entire medical history, yeah. which means that you don't spend a half an hour in the waiting room just filling out the same yeah. information that you filled out at least a hundred times yeah. before. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just talked to a woman in Marysville just recently, and uh, the processing fee for one form was $125. Uh -huh. So that would eliminate all of these processing yeah. fees for the various insurance companies that doctors yeah. have to deal with. And all of that is waste that causes the doctor or the nurse or the pharmacist or whoever to take time away from the patient because they're doing the damn paperwork. That's right. And, and arguing again, and on again, the phone with right. trying to, can we get coverage for this person? Can we provide this treatment? And arguing with the insurance company that takes time away. And again, it increases the cost of, of yeah. services you yeah. cover. Yeah. Uh, they have the Washington Health Security Coalition also they want the uh, health care benefits to be very comprehensive and I wonder if you could talk about the comprehensive aspects of it. Well, um, you're going to have your choice of doctor. Uh, again, it's just as important as uh, the right to free speech or voting. Uh, you can go to any doctor that you want to. Um, so you'll have a, a GP to look after you, a general practitioner, mm -hmm. your doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, you will also receive um, uh, care in an emergency room or in a hospital mm -hmm. of your choice. Uh, you will receive outpatient services. You'll receive uh, preventative medicine as well. Um, it will also cover vision, hearing, and dental, as well as uh, chiropractic. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it will also cover pharmaceutical supplies, medicine. Uh, it will uh, negotiate prices with the pharmaceutical companies yeah. so that we can bring down the cost of yeah. medication. Uh, there is also included well baby care, prenatal care, and postnatal care. Um, I don't know what I've, what I've left out. Well, the important thing about comprehensiveness is that uh, it is indeed comprehensive. Um, the insurance carriers, 
the opponents of health care reform are saying that um, they're the only ones that could provide choice. Mm -hmm. And the way they provide choice, unfortunately, is by providing policies that have fewer and fewer features in them. That's why you have so many uh, bankruptcies uh, from individuals who are underinsured rather than uninsured. Mm -hmm. So you could purchase a policy that maybe is major medical mm -hmm. and it doesn't cover anything else. That's what they see as choice. What we see as choice is that everyone have the same benefits mm -hmm. and they have a choice of which doctor to choose, which right. doctor to go to. Right, and a lot of those uh, insurance companies say you have to choose somebody from our preferred provider Correct. or else we don't pay it at all. And this, what you're proposing, really is a lot more choice. Um, the uh, criteria from the same uh, folks also uh, want it to be efficient and cost effective. We've talked about that a little bit. Is there anything else that you want to add to? Uh... I think there's one important facet, which is evidence-based medicine. Mm -hmm. um, our health care problem is, is really something that we all brought about, not just the insurance companies or the doctors, but we all brought about. And um, those countries that have successfully handled the medical care of their, of their population and have high grades when compared to other countries um, are trying to uh, treat them in a holistic manner uh, with the best evidence-based practice. So you won't have somebody going to five different doctors with the same ailment and receiving five different treatments mm -hmm. that are totally different. They're going to treat the person with the, with the proper care and the proper treatment and not waste, again, dollars in, in, in treatment that may not help the situation or in some cases could even aggravate the situation yeah. even further. Both of you are strong supporters of a single payer system. And I wonder if we could talk about that for a few minutes. Let's start by uh, s putting out there just the basics of what a single payer system means. Well, um, actually the purest definition of a single payer system is that it's a public financing system, which means that everyone in the state or in the country would be paying into one fund. And um, it would eliminate all of the insurance companies, and I think that's our main goal, mm -hmm. uh, because they're draining uh, money away from all kinds mm -hmm. of other programs. But inherent with uh, the single payer, one of the uh, provisions in any single payer bill would be to eliminate the financial middleman who actually interferes with a doctor's mm -hmm. right to uh, diagnose and uh, to prescribe therapy. Yeah. So that's inherent in a single payer system and uh, we really need to have that provision in a single payer system because as we all know, we can be denied care because a financial middleman says, well, if you've got diabetes or heart disease or a pre-existing condition mm -hmm. of some sort, mm -hmm. uh, you're not eligible for any more mm -hmm. uh, uh, benefits. But, um, you know, the single payer is going to be highly regulated so that we have one budget. And frankly, this is uh, characteristic of all the other industrialized nations is a strict budget for uh, doctors, hospitals, and pharmaceutical companies. That way we can control the cost of health care. Mm -hmm. Well, and then there'd be, with, with that, there's an economy of scale because you don't have all the redundancy and all the different things. And then the government would really have clout in negotiating with the pharmaceutical companies to reduce the prices and likewise with hospitals or whatever. Whereas the, with Bush's uh, drug benefit for, for Medicare, the Republicans wrote into the law that the government cannot right. negotiate low prices with, with the drug companies. And so this, this, this would open the way to, to doing a lot of cost savings by just the, that efficiency as well as the efficiency of eliminating the middleman who not only works against the doctors, as you say, but the middleman works against the patient as well. Precisely. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, there's another aspect that, that we haven't mentioned yet that, that it's fully portable and it's not based on your job. So I know people who are trapped in jobs that they hate because they are afraid if they leave that job they, they won't have health care. And, and that's quite true. I mean if, if somebody has a uh, condition, for example diabetes, 
um, if they went from one position to another, from one job to another, they would have maybe a 90-day, 120-day, one-year mm -hmm. waiting list before they could then be covered yeah. uh, for the same for that diabetes. Right. Um, in a single-payer system, since insurance wouldn't be tied to the employer, you're free to go from job to job, yeah. and you're not being held captive by yeah. an employer. Or you could be self-employed or part-time employed. Or one of us uh, one of, on the phone in preparing for the program, one of you mentioned like nonprofit organizations that commonly are very short on funding and have a hard time paying adequate mm -hmm. benefits. Uh, so people would be more free to work for nonprofit organizations Correct. because the health care would come through the government. Right, and portability would also work uh, marvelously uh, in the event that you know you turn 56 and, and you decided to retire. Mm -hmm. you, would have, you would have your health care benefits there. Mm -hmm. uh, if a man and woman uh, decides that the marriage isn't working mm -hmm. out, Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have to see oh. which one is going to provide the benefits. They're automatically yeah. covered, yeah. and so and, are the and so children. The kids, yeah. Yeah. And if there's a, um, an 18-year-old who doesn't want to go to college but wants to go to mm -hmm. a vo tech, uh, vo vocational mm -hmm. school to learn a trade, he's automatically covered. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a magnitude of uh, yeah. opportunity out there. We have this kind of sense about some of our functions in society if, if if you if your house catches on fire you don't have to worry about uh, gee does my does the local fire department cover grease fires in in a frying pan mm -hmm. or not and you have to look at your insurance company right. uh, document to see if 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 the fire department will come out and put out a grease fire in a frying pan uh, or an electrical right. fire or greasy rags in the garage or something you just call 911 and the, and the fire department comes out, no questions asked. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't hassle you. That's right. And, and we're used to that. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, I can go to the library and check out anything. I don't need to worry about, geez, it, does my library policy include fiction? Does it include <laughs> videos? You know, you can go to the library, you get anything you want. And yet with today's insurance policies, and for my example, I have a $500 deductible. Yeah. So I have to think about, okay, how often do I want to go in for an exam? Um, because I'm going to be paying for it out of my own pocket. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in all the years that I've had insurance, I've never used up my deductible. I've always, you know, so I've paid the premium plus. Yeah. I saw a, a uh, reference to a public opinion poll showing that about 119 million Americans would dump their current plans and choose something like Medicare for everybody if they had the choice, if that was available. And Medicare is basically a single-payer system, and people are used to that, although it has shortcomings and people have to buy these supplemental things. But we, we have that sense that if you're old, you should be entitled to health care. Mm -hmm. and, and we finally got that through in the early 60s. And, and we haven't extended that to the and rest just of the population. Think, just think, though, if we did extend it and had Medicare for everyone, as, as many people might know, the majority of your medical expenses are incurred in the last years of your life. Mm -hmm. So with Medicare, they're first getting people and covering people when they are in their last part of their life mm -hmm. where the medical expenses are so much higher. If we had everybody covered under the same plan, then the cost per individual spread out over the entire population would be much lower than Medicare is now for the individuals they currently cover. Uh huh. Yeah, because everybody is in the same risk pool. Correct. Uh, there are some other additional advantages. When we were talking on the phone, you were talking about the budget stability, and you mentioned that a moment ago. Is there anything else you want to mention that, about that? or anything else about other advantages to single payer? Well, for a, for a small business, for example, um, you know, I work in the finance department for uh, public transportation, and one of the things that we're looking at on, on a yearly basis is how much we budget for health care. Uh, a small business, in this case, would have a, a predictable budget every single year for health care. It would be around 10%, according to some of the proposals in front of Congress. Mm -hmm. So you take that 10% and you know how many employees you're going to have from one year to the next and you calculate that in and all of the money that you save from a single payer system you can put into marketing. Mm -hmm. You can put into uh, a capital campaign of some sort, buying machinery. Mm -hmm. You could actually recruit the people that you really want to have to work for you. Mm -hmm. um, and the list goes on and on and on. So your business is going to thrive because you know 
from one year to the next how much your health care is yeah. going to be. So it's, it's predictable, it's stable, and frankly, um, it would be the greatest economic stimulus package in the history of the United States if we do health care reform right. Mm. And if we don't, I can guarantee you here in Olympia and in Washington, D.C., we'll, continual, we'll continuously um, cut funds for education, for public housing, for retirement mm. systems, and so on and so forth. But we got to do it right now. Yeah. Yeah. And again, regarding business, look at the headlines in the past weeks and months uh, about some of the auto manufacturers mm -hmm. and their problems. Mm -hmm. If you look at the majority of the overhead that they have, the debt that they have, mm -hmm. the debt is relating to health care costs mm -hmm. for their employees. Mm -hmm. If they were if they were freed up of that burden of having to provide health care costs, mm -hmm. they could be far more competitive. Mm -hmm. And the auto manufacturers, for example, and many other manufacturers in this country, steel, whatever complain that, that their cost of doing business is much higher in the other countries because the other countries have single-payer health care and they just can't compete. Right. So it would make us a more competitive country. That's right, yeah. You, you lived in France and you can tell us something about how that worked, what your experience was in terms of cost and accessibility and efficiency. Yes, uh, I kind can. Of, kind of briefly, we're running a bit late, but. Yeah, um, frankly right now <clears throat> in France, uh, health care costs 8% of your monthly salary or wage, mm -hmm. 8%. It's been like that for, I think, two years. But when I first arrived in France, it was 7%. Mm -hmm. And then it went up to 7.5%. But mm -hmm. I, I left France 15 years ago. And uh, so it's only increased 1% mm -hmm. over that in, uh, entire 15 years. So, um, you know, again, families save tons of money they're able to put money into a savings account, into buying a home or a new car or go on vacation, mm -hmm. and they have five weeks paid vacation in mm -hmm. France. Yeah. So that's a real burden on families. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, and you said that it was, it, was, it was very efficient for you. Oh, you know, uh, when I lived in Paris, I just walked down the street and I could choose any doctor I wanted to. So when I went into the doctor's office, like Kent was saying, when we were younger, yeah. you know, there was a doctor and a receptionist. But in France, there was just a doctor. So the doctor would come out and say, next. And you'd go in, he'd check you over. And they had a computer system. They had their health care card. He would slide it through the system. He would say, do you still live at this address? And you would say, yes. He says, what pharmacy do you want to go to to pick up your medication? He'd type it in. You go to the pharmacy, pick up your medication, and the deal was done. Yeah. You just had this little chip in your card. Everything was taken care of. You didn't see a bill. People raise all kinds of objections to single payer. I mean, all kinds of stuff. Um, what are some of these arguments that people raise against it, like taxes? I was just going to bring that up, actually. Larry spoke of this wonderful system in France. Now, the opponents of single payer in this country say, well, it's just going to increase your taxes. You know, your taxes are just going to go sky high. Well, the reality is that we're paying those taxes right now. Mm -hmm. I'm paying those taxes by paying an insurance premium. I'm paying those taxes by paying deductibles. I'm paying those taxes by paying coinsurance. I'm paying those taxes by paying higher rates for my care to cover those who aren't insured at all. Mm -hmm. So we're all paying for it now. Mm -hmm. but it's just not called taxes. Yeah. So that's really a large fallacy. Well, we also pay for it in having worse health outcomes. Correct. Mm -hmm. So many people are chronically sick mm -hmm. because they can't afford to go. I have a good friend who I was talking with just last night uh, needed root canal. She couldn't afford it, and she, she had pain in, it was on this side, uh, for about two years until she finally was able to get money from a family member to pay for a root canal. I mean, can you imagine mm -hmm. having that pain for two years? Well, the worst thing is she's lucky if she had root canal because after two years of leaving that alone, she probably lost her tooth altogether. Yeah, right? and or the, the, the infection gets through the body and, and, heart and, attack. and kills yeah. her. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so the taxes thing, people complain that it's socialized medicine. Well, you know, they have socialized medicine in Canada. Um, so to speak, but uh, if you want to say socialized medicine, I would say go to England mm -hmm. because that's where uh, the government actually pays a doctor in the hospitals. Right. They are on the, the government till. 
But you know, um, I have given a lot of presentations and people say, well, taxes in Canada are really high. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, have you ever known anybody in Canada that pays for their uh, premiums on a monthly basis? Just go online to the British, uh, uh, British Columbia um, Ministry of Health and you'll find how much they pay. For an individual, it's $54 a month. For a family, it's $106 a month. That's not high taxes as far as I'm mm -hmm. concerned, mm -hmm. but they're covered. Mm -hmm. Every right. single person in British Columbia and is again, covered. Talking about socialization, yeah. that's not a dirty word. We have socialized fire departments yeah. in this country. Yeah. We have the VA. The yeah. Veterans Administration. Yeah. Ask any any unfortunate soldier who got injured and goes to the VA and ask him how he felt his service was. The VA is excellent. Uh -huh. It really works very efficiently yeah. and provides proper care yeah. to the uh, people that go there. Yeah, I drove to the TV studio on a socialized road. I did, it wasn't like a privately owned one with a toll booth. You know, I just got in the car and drove here. So yeah, it's, I drove it's, from it's, Bellingham. It's covered with, by our taxes. Yeah. So mean, it's, it's not it's, a dirty word. It's way so better than having toll roads, every, toll booth every couple blocks. But they're coming. But yeah, well, they're, <laughs> they're, they're pushing that. What about the article, or the argument about uh, waiting lines? Um, I could just bring up an example. Um, I have a dear friend of mine who um, developed cataracts and she was covered by insurance and they said, yep, you have cataracts and it'll be, oh, roughly a nine months wait until you can have your cataract surgery. Um, we have waiting lines in this country. Mm -hmm. um, waiting lines are, are, are prevalent here. Yeah. Well, my friend had to wait two years to get her root canal because she didn't have any money. Yeah. She had to work out a deal with a relative. Correct. Now, Larry seems, I think you mentioned um, the average waiting time in Canada is... For all ailments and uh, you know, elective surgeries, is three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, here's another point. Let's take, for example, someone my age who is not in very good health. They may have some type of heart disease or diabetes or whatever. In Canada, you're going to be treated for that. You don't have to wait. Mm -hmm. But if I'm here in the United States and my insurance company has denied me care for heart disease or mm -hmm. diabetes, how long am I going to wait okay. to get a new policy? Yeah. I'll have to wait another 10 years before I'm eligible for Medicare. What's the difference between three weeks and 10 years? Yeah. That's, yes. a, that's yeah. a long waiting so the, period. So, the, yeah, the insurance companies in, in this country impose right. the waiting lists. They sure do. And, you know, yeah. the, the, the opponents, again, are saying, look at Canada. The Canada Canadians are fleeing across the border like fleas, trying to get health care in the United States. Um, an organization actually stood by the border up in Washington mm -hmm. to see how many people were going across from the United States and to, uh, from Canada to the United States to get coverage. They didn't see this mass of people. Mm -hmm. Most can, people who were born in Canada and are living in the United States, they carry their dual citizenship. Why? Mm -hmm. Because as soon as they retire, they're going to go back to Canada for their health care. Mm -hmm. Canadians love their health care system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen surveys where they've asked Canadians and people from the States, you know, do you like your health care system? And overwhelmingly, the Canadians like it, and overwhelmingly, the people in the U.S. And, you know, don't. Those, those few times you hear in exceptions, and again, there was a TV program shortly uh, by one of the opponents um, saying how somebody from Canada had to go to the United States to get an operation because they couldn't get in in Canada. Well, they made it sound like this person had to pay for it out of their pocket. The reality is... In central Canada, just like in the central United States, it's, it's a lot of farmland. And the facilities are not as uh, populated and prevalent as they are on the east and west coast of Canada. So what happens is if somebody needs an operation, a specialty operation, it may just be that on the United States they have availability. The Canadian government will send that person to the United States and the Canadian government will pay the bill, not the person. Yeah. Because it's closer than sending it's it out efficient. to the west coast or the east coast yeah. if you live in Manitoba. It's more efficient. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Minnesota is yeah. closer than uh, uh, Toronto or, or Vancouver. Vancouver. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, let, we're running a bit tight. I want to see that we address this public option thing that Obama has said. Let's keep the insurance companies, but allow a public option as well, and then people can choose. 
Well, it's really up in the air. We don't really know what the public option is. It hasn't been very well defined. As, as, the, as of the date that we're taping the program. Exactly. It's, it's being kicked around. And uh, one of the things that really concerns me about the Obama plan is uh, about three weeks ago, he was in New Mexico saying that okay. you know, he didn't want to disrupt the insurance industry. In my opinion, we have to have uh, an insurance, we have to have a policy here in the United States that covers care first because families and businesses look at GM is totally disrupted. Mm -hmm. The state of California, the, the budget yeah. there is, is about to shut down. Yeah. But, you know, we need to take care of the people first. Yeah. And so that's what uh, a public option should do. So that's. Yeah. Now, the insurance companies complain that a public option would, would make the government an unfair competitor to them. Um, well, I thought I thought private the private sector like competition. Yes, they like competition, but, but they don't want long, it if they're going to lose. That's correct. Yeah. Um, but again, the public option, the devil is in the details. Um, a good public option will have all of those points that the Washington Health Security Coalition mentioned. Um, so, the public option has to be carefully mm -hmm. engineered and created, or else it could be just be a, a sham and really yeah. make the situation worse. Yeah, I'd be concerned that they would, uh, that the private insurance would skim off as they've been doing the healthy people mm -hmm. and leave the people who have serious health problems to go for the public option right. because they can't get private insurance. Then the public option is saddled with all the sick people in the country and that drives up the cost. And then the pr private sector can say, see the government system is too expensive. Right. Exactly. So that that's the danger mm -hmm. that I'm seeing. Correct. Right. But um, who, who, what kinds of folks support single payer and what kind of folks oppose it? Well, you got a, I'd say a majority of small businesses that now realize that, you know, they're so saddled with uh, health insurance costs just to operate their business. They would really like to have something that relieves th uh, them of that. Um, I think you're seeing a lot of uh, unions across the United States who support single payer. Uh, there's uh, nurses associations. Um, there's there is a lot of support. Mm -hmm. Even uh, physicians for national health care programs say mm -hmm. that uh, there's about 60 percent of the physicians in the country that support single payer. Yeah. So it's across the board. Mm -hmm. um, but you know the media and Congress wants to keep that information yeah, they're under just the carpet. trying to stifle that right the the um, the individuals and companies and, and types of people that are afraid that their income would be affected are the opponents mm -hmm. so you have Wall Street as an opponent you have the insurance carriers as a definite opponent even uh, many doctors specialists who are um, highly highly paid are concerned that a single payer system will affect their 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 uh, revenue and and are opposed to it, um, but when you speak to the to the average general practitioner, family doctor, and they are very much in favor of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in in Olympia and in Washington, we have Group Health. Mm -hmm. um, down in Southern California, you have Kaiser Permanente. These are doctors that are paid a salary per year, mm -hmm. and they work you know set number of hours. They're very very happy because they can concentrate on providing health care. Yeah, that's that's been my impression and the conversations I've had with mm -hmm. Group Health doctors yeah. is they want to practice medicine they don't want to do paperwork and billing correct yeah. that's right the uh, and the pharmaceutical companies right now are making out like bandits and some of the hospitals correct. and stuff so those would be on the opposing side right. um, the stakeholders basically and, are the ones yeah are. yeah the uh, there's some political aspects of this as things get worked out in Congress and in state legislatures um, I mean it, it it's obvious that some of these uh, uh, politicians get big big donations. I was just reading that um, U.S. Senator Chuck uh, Grassley, uh, the ranking Republican on the Senate Finance Committee that's going to deal with this issue, uh, since 2005 his political action committees have collected almost 1.3 million dollars in donations from businesses that relate to health, insurance, pharmaceuticals, hospitals, and HMOs. I mean, some of these politicians are so much dependent on that campaign funding. Right, and uh, that, Senator Bacchus, who is heading up yeah, this yeah. Uh, reform uh, in Washington, D.C., is uh, 
has received one of the highest amounts of campaign contributions from pharmaceutical insurance companies yeah. and, and likewise. Yeah, and he's from Montana, which he's is from, not where those places are based. But right. you know, but so, here the point I'm trying to make is I think it's a big conflict of interest on his part mm -hmm. to be reforming health care. Mm -hmm. So who's, whose benefit is he going to reform it yeah. into? You know, he's going to concentrate first on his contributors' interest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And no, uh, yeah. so that's a real concern. One of our strongest allies in the state of Washington is Washington Public Campaigns. Yes. Who are striving to uh, remove the money from public from campaigns, allow uh, an even playing field so that money and uh, political contributions aren't going to sway our politicians. Um, frankly, I, I would be so incensed and angry um, if if we took we had this opportunity for major reform. Mm -hmm. And all we did was was just skirted the issue and and just mm -hmm. provided um, more revenue for the insurance carriers. Mm -hmm. I think many of our young, the youth who have come out and voted in droves in this last presidential election, um, may very well be frustrated and never come out and vote again. Well, a lot of the, a lot of young people don't have health coverage because many of them don't have jobs that are Correct. well paying enough. Or you're you're mm -hmm. part time waitress or you're doing you know odd jobs of this or that with no benefits, uh, those folks are, uh, you know, you, you may be healthy when you're in your 20s, but, you know, a few decades down the road, you're going to need it and then you won't have it. So those folks are lacking health care and, and they, that would be worth paying attention to. Right. They are, they are nicknamed the young immortals. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and the problem with that is, you know, a young immortal goes to work on a motorcycle, gets into a motorcycle accident, winds up in the hospital, hundred fifty, two hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Taxpayers pay for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you summarize uh, the basic sense of the federal legislation that's been introduced? Both there's been legislation in the Senate, and two bills I'm aware of in the House. Mm -hmm. And without going into the details, we don't have time for the details, but can you take like a, a minute or two just to summarize yeah, the um, sense of those? Yeah, first of all, in the House there are two bills. One is H.R. 676, mm -hmm. which is uh, sponsored by um, uh, John Rep Representative Conyers. John Conyers from Michigan. Uh, the other one is from our yeah. uh, representative here in Washington State, yeah, Jim uh, McDermott, uh, with H.R. Uh, 1200. Mm -hmm. uh, they are very similar, except that H.R. Uh, 676 covers uh, its one plan for the entire United States. Jim McDermott's plan actually says individual states can uh, devise their own plans for single payer. On the Senate side, uh, Senator Bernie uh, Sanders from Vermont uh, with uh, Senate Bill 703 mm -hmm. is a replica of um, Jim McDermott's bill. Uh, mm -hmm. All of them are single payer, and all of them would be the best that the country can offer mm -hmm. if we have it in, in that uh, mm -hmm. right. manner to, to but have. But politically, none of those bills are ever going to leave committee, and the committee chairs are making sure those bills won't leave committee. Uh -huh. What's being discussed now as far as what is uh, for health care reform is to make sure the insurance companies have to cover everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, the insurance companies say we'll do that as long as, and they're asking for a whole bunch of other things to make sure that they're compensated. Mm -hmm. Now, there have been efforts at the state level in Washington, Massachusetts passed something that basically pushed everybody into insurance companies, and uh, there have been efforts in some of those states to do various mm -hmm. things. Yeah, the Massachusetts plan is actually, uh, I think the canary is going to fall off the perch on that one because uh -huh. uh, First of all, it's mandatory that every uh, resident in Massachusetts buy health care uh, insurance mm -hmm. so that they're all covered. Uh, however, the cost has gone through the roof. Right. It has increased over 50% in two years. So as a consequence, again, yeah. they have to cut other yeah. programs yeah. just to finance their health care program. Yeah. Well, and then individual people must be hurting 
Yeah, individual families yeah, so, and small businesses. Yeah, yeah, they're all hurting. Yeah. And again, it goes back. Major health care reform has to, has to encompass not only insurance issues, but it has to cover uh, the way medicine is being provided, uh, the healthiness and the personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, one issue alone is not going to change anything right. in this country. But getting rid of the insurance companies is a major thing. Help. And then you've mentioned, when we were talking on the phone to prepare, you mentioned like evidence-based medicine. Correct. Uh, best practices basically, doing Correct. things right. Right, I mentioned it here in this program, and, okay. that as long as, as you, that um, there's a lot of wasteful medicine going on. Also there's um, hospitals. Uh, hospitals have a high degree of staff infection. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that shouldn't be. Um, that has to be controlled. Uh, prescriptions, one doctor prescribes one thing, another doctor prescribes another thing. Nobody's looking to see how they interact. Right, and, so, and this, this would be a real safeguard. Correct. Exactly. Because because you, the the doctor, or if you go to a different doctor, or the pharmacist, somebody would know. Oh, there's going to be a an adverse reaction from this exactly. medicine sure. to that one, and right. they prevent some of those Absolutely. problems and save money mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. that way and save lives, save lives yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've been covering a lot of information, and we're we're headed toward a wrap up. I wonder if we can summarize some of the main points that 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 you found most compelling about why single payer or about the problems and single payer as a solution? Just to reinforce some of these main points that we've been addressing or if there's anything else that, that we haven't yet addressed but that. Well, I think number one, and Larry and I can switch off, number one and most important is everyone is covered. Everyone has a right to health care and everyone should get health care. Right. and. Uh, you know, one of the things that we really need to look at here is there should never, ever be any financial barriers to care. What good is quality care if we can't have access to it because of financial means? Uh, so single payer would really make this whole crisis obsolete. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I'm looking at. Single payer will again reduce uh, will in maximize the amount of health care dollars that are actually going towards health care mm -hmm. rather than wasteful administrative yeah. and, and profit expense. Yeah, I know. Uh, people I've mentioned before, but people just hate bureaucracy and the, the insurance company bureaucracy of, of redundant systems, redundant advertising, redundant claim mm -hmm. forms and rules and exclusions. It, it just, it's just a horrible waste and, and they're not accountable. Mm -hmm. Even President Obama's memory of his mother, his last memories of his mother in a hospital bed dying of cancer, on the phone arguing with insurance carriers trying mm -hmm. to get her, her health care paid for so that um, her, her heirs are not um, a burden by that additional mm -hmm. expense. Mm -hmm. When I was preparing for the program, um, I read one article that says it boils down to two things. Question one is, should every American be entitled to health care as a human right and not just as a privilege? That was one basic question mm -hmm. they said we need to answer as a nation. Second question this person said was, how can we provide high quality health care to everyone in the most cost effective way? Right. One of the problems in this country is that we are a market driven economy. That capitalism is supposed to be the end all of everything. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, capitalism has no conscience. Mm -hmm. We have to remove profits from medicine. Well, and, and markets don't work for some things. I mean, the, the financial market of, of some things just doesn't work. You saw what happens when, when Wall Street is left to its own devices mm -hmm. and let money do whatever kind of silly thing money wants to do. That stuff needs to be curtailed. That just doesn't work. Uh, auctioning off our elections to the highest bidder, the biggest campaign donors, that does not work. That damages democracy and turning our health over to uh, capitalism mm -hmm. as the driving force does not work The American for people in the last 20 years have been asking the government that we must have some changes, we need help. The government has gone to the insurance carriers and the insurance carriers have said, let the market handle it, it'll take care of it. For 20 years mm -hmm. the market has failed to take yeah. care of it. We are in a worse shape right. today than we were 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> what we have to do in healthcare reform is put the interest of health first, first yes, because right. as we're saying here, we're at the mercy of the market, mm -hmm. and as we all know, there is no mercy in the market. You, you guys are active with several organizations that work for these. I want to just lift these up uh, and and uh, 
promote them. They're all great sources sure. of information. Uh, Healthcare for All Washington, you're the... I'm the president of Healthcare yeah. for All Washington, and uh, we've been ex in existence since 1999, uh -huh. and we're going strong right now. Yeah, and I've been a member from the beginning. Yes, you have. It's very, it's a very good organization. Uh, there's the Washington Health Security Coalition. You had a guest from that on the program last time that we talked about uh, single-payer uh, a couple years ago. Right, and I'm the legislative co-chair of the Washington Health Security Coalition, and we have a coalition of 30 or 40 organizations. If you look at the number of people um, related to that, we have over 60,000 people that, that we can reach with our message, mm -hmm. and we are striving towards a single-payer health care reform system yeah. in this country. Yeah, and I know that's an active group. There's a Physicians for a National Health Program that has a number of doctors in the Puget Sound area active. And yeah, very active. All up and down the I-5 corridor, and actually they have uh, a few chapters on the east side of oh, the mountains. Very good. So um, they're a very active organization nationwide, and we actually work closely with them. Uh -huh. So, and then we mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned Washington public campaigns. They've seen the linkage between their driving force of trying to get the big money out of election campaigns and have public funding so there's a more profound democracy that's not being controlled by the special interests. And they realize that that there's a common interest with uh, single payer. Yeah, most definitely and, there and, is. And, and so it's exciting to see these two movements mm -hmm. uh, collaborate. How would you like the viewers to help uh, solve these problems? Well, first of all, as we see uh, today, they're going to have to get active because some of our legislators are not actively in working in our best interest. Mm -hmm. So it would behoove us as a community to get involved with one of our organizations, but also make their voice heard in the street. Mm -hmm. I don't think our legislators are going to do anything on our interest if they don't hear from us. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say. And I think yeah. it's critical that now that individuals should contact their, their federal representatives, their federal senators, and implore that there be major health care reform, mm -hmm. that single payer um, be considered, that a public plan be fashioned after a single payer system. Mm -hmm. I know one of the things that, that people can do because it, it needs all that people power is for people to debunk the propaganda. When, when you and I were talking on the phone, right. Kent, to prepare for this, you mentioned that that you want to be able to inoculate the people Correct. against the, the propaganda that's coming out and give people solid information. And the organizations that you folks work with and that the others that we mentioned are all great sources of information. I encourage people to go to their websites and, and read the stuff, print out what you need, and get, get the, the good sense in our heads and the, and the facts and how to counter those arguments against single payer. And then when a conversation comes up, with, with somebody to be able to set mm -hmm. them straight about the, the myth about Canada or the myth about taxes or right. the, whatever the thing might be. Or Harry and Louise today yes. has diabetes and, and you know, <laughs> yeah. has erectile yeah. dysfunction or whatever. Care. Yeah. Yeah. That's right, yeah. yeah so, uh, so we need to get the middleman out of medicine. That's right, so. yeah, that's right. Get, get Harry and Louise some care. Yeah. That's right, get, get rid of those insurance companies. Yeah, so that's great, thanks, I appreciate that. Um, and and the, yeah, the politicians really do need to hear from people. Don't assume that because we know the right values that they're hearing that because they're they've got so many lobbyists just climbing all over them. So, can we offer a closing thought from from each of you? My thought is that we have to do it now. That this is this is the golden opportunity, and if we don't do health care reform this year, if we fail to do it, we're going to have the same old, same old and we need the public's involvement. Everyone has to speak up, everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, years ago I was uh, a translator and I ran across a Lakota Indian proverb mm -hmm. and it was so simple but very profound. And it said, whenever you find yourself riding on a dead horse, the best thing to do is to get off. <laughs> so we, ha we need to get off this dead horse yes. insurance uh, yeah. scheme because it's not helping any of us. Right. So great. Well, thanks. I, I want to thank Larry Kalb and Kent Davis for all the, the good information and, and encouragement that, that you've been offering. I want to thank all the folks who've been watching. The United States treats health care as a privilege for those who can afford it and, 
as uh, just a benefit for those who have good jobs. Our country treats health care just as a commercial commodity at the mercy of the capitalist market. This strikes me as cruel and barbaric. Other countries recognize health care as a basic human right. That's the humane way to proceed. Other modern industrial countries use a single payer system to provide better health care at a lower cost. Public opinion polls show that the American people want a major overhaul of the health care system. The single payer system is the only way to solve the various problems efficiently, economically, and democratically. That's small d democratically. The single payer solution can cover everyone, improve health care results, and save money. Obama and Congress must decide whether they represent the American people mm -hmm. or the special interests. The insurance companies, uh, we've, we've got our work cut out for us to uh, go up against the, the, that power. The nation's health care system is broken. We need fundamental changes. The American people want sweeping reforms. Obama is popular and the Democrats control both the House and the Senate, so now is the time to be bold. This is the right historical moment for single-payer health care. So again, I want to thank Larry and Kent. I want to thank the folks who have been watching. You can learn more about single-payer health care from the organizations that we're listing with the closing credits. For information about a variety of issues, you can contact the, P the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation uh, at 360-491-9093 or www.olyfor.org. We're all one human family, and we all share one planet. We can create a better world, but we all have to work on it. And the world needs what you have to offer. Thanks.